On the first Sunday in December 1941, Americans were doing what Americans did on any normal Sunday. I had been to see another string of interminable westerns at, uh, at the plaza, which we went every Saturday and Sunday, and uh, Guns of the Pecos was the movie that was playing. My father and I were in the living room listening to the Giants football game. My father was sitting next to me suddenly when they announced that Pearl Harbor was attacked. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor by air. I came home to a household that was somber and quiet and the radio was on and uh, was told that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, which I had no idea where it was. I'll tell you what struck my mind, I thought it was somewhere in Oregon. <laughs> Soon every American would know that over 2,000 of their countrymen had perished in the Japanese attack on Hawaii's Pearl Harbor, and that nearly half the U.S. fleet had been destroyed. Well, it was absolute horror. People were just shocked. When it happens, you don't know what to think. You're just standing there wondering what, what happens now. And it was terrifying. We sat down and looked at each other for a couple of minutes, and Max said, no more civilian clothes. It was a very bad time. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked no matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. President Roosevelt told an America shocked out of its isolation and innocence that in order to win this war, every man, woman, and child would have to become part of the fight. Never before have we been called upon for such a prodigious effort. Never before have we had so little time in which to do so much. We may forget at the end of the century that America in the early 1940s was far from a superpower. Its army was ranked 19th in the world behind Holland and Portugal. Its industry was still in the grip of a lingering depression. The war, of course, would change all that and many other things as well. It would unite the country in a way never known before or since. To understand the American home front during the war years, you have to understand the texture of the times, a time so naive that most Americans didn't know their president couldn't walk certainly a time before television, an instant satellite transmission, when war news took days or weeks to reach newspapers and the newsreels. The survival of democracy was by no means assured. I remember as a young boy, uh, fear of the Japanese, that submarines were going to come up in Santa Monica, and, you know, uh, there was a lot of fear then. Just four days after the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy declared war on the United States. The world was a very dark place. 
The German U-boats were sinking tankers right off the uh, coast of uh, Florida and New Jersey, within sight of uh, bathers on the beach. The oceans, which had historically kept America invulnerable, had been penetrated by enemies from both east and west. We had to destroy those people to save ourselves and to save the United States. Then we all rushed off to the recruiting stations. Everybody I knew who was, was my age or close to it was in the services. If you were brave, you were in the Marine Corps. Everybody was in one thing or another, and almost all of us were in the Army. The Axis had to be defeated, and we knew that nobody was going to do it except us. Yeah, my father went to war, and uh, he was uh, managed a little grocery store, uh, IGA grocery store, and uh, he went to Springfield, Missouri to go through basic training. Volunteers and draftees shed their civilian identities in basic training camps that united grocers from Kansas with mechanics from Monterey and bookkeepers from Brooklyn. Within six months, many would be sent to battlefields around the world, leaving behind parents, wives, and children. I really adored my father. I mean, it was a, you know, I admired him, I loved him. He was a wonderful father. And, um, you know, the thought of life without him was, un, un, you know, unimaginable to me. It was sort of the hand one was dealt, and your father was going to war in a good cause. And, uh, and I was very proud of him. We got married, and then he enlisted. His goal was to be a pilot on a B-24, and he achieved it. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant. He got his wings the uh, same week his son was born. We were all taught uh, when your husband becomes an officer, you're an officer's wife. And you do not show any emotions when they go overseas. You hold it back no matter what, no crying. And we did that. It was tough. From an army of 300,000 in 1940, American armed forces would swell to 15 million. At the beginning of the war, there was considerable fear that these hastily assembled citizen soldiers could hold their own against a highly trained and heavily equipped enemy. News from the front had not been good. Three months after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had inflicted a series of humiliating defeats on an America whose confidence was shaken. On February 23, 1942, the president tried to calm and to rally a frightened nation. This is war. The American people want to know and will be told the general trend of how the war is going. The president had asked every American to follow his speech on a map. I had huge maps on my wall from the backs of newspapers. I marked it with crayon, uh, and uh, I remember uh, you know, putting arrows and X's and circling towns. We Americans have been compelled to yield ground, but we will regain it. We I remember his confidence and the tone of his voice and the closeness that you felt to him. He was a beacon of light. Oh boy, when he came on the radio. Soon we and not our enemies will have the offensive. We, not they, will win the final battle. And he had the capacity of moving us with words, of inspiring the country, of lifting the country to do more than it might do otherwise. There is one thought for us here at home to keep up among the fulfillment of our special task of production, uninterrupted production. So make your mind up when you get out of bed. Work your head off so you can keep your head. 
Government films pounded home the fact that America not only had to supply its own troops, but meet the needs of its allies as well. Workers in cities across the country responded. During the war at night, the mills would be going full blast, and the sky would pulse red with the uh, blast furnaces going off. And we were told at school, and we heard on the radio and saw in the newspaper that Pittsburgh was helping to win the war. In Detroit, it took just nine months to convert the entire capacity of the American automobile industry to war production. They dubbed Detroit as the arsenal of democracy. The plants operated 24 hours a day, around the clock. You had bombers coming off the line every five minutes. Work till they almost fall out, then somebody take your place. I was working on the Jeeps. I sprayed the Jeeps with this out of paint. Can you imagine working 18 and 24 hours a day, staying in the shop? You run home and look at your family, run back to the shop again. With existing manpower strapped to the limit, there was another pool of workers ready to be tapped. Factory owners were very reluctant to hire women. They argued they'll never learn how to operate these complex machines, and if they come onto the assembly line, they'll distract the men. Productivity will go way down. And besides, they shouldn't leave their homes. It'll be the end of the home and the family. But then by about 1942 or 1943, when so many men were in the armed forces, they had to turn to women. So suddenly the whole attitude toward women coming to work changed. Between 1940 and 1944, the number of women in war-related industries rose 460 percent to a high of 19 million, a full third of the entire civilian workforce. Half of those women were wives and mothers who had never held jobs before. My mother was a nice lady who baked and cooked and cleaned house and uh, whacked her kids around to make sure they stayed in line. And uh, suddenly, she's running a machine at uh, an aircraft factory. She felt she needed to do something. I think there was an underlying, unexpressed kind of patriotism, not the kind that waves flags, but it was the kind that loved our lives that loved our country, and we all worked for one reason, to get those airplanes in the sky. In Boeing, Seattle plant, half the workers were women. In just four years, they turned out over 12,000 B-17 bombers. They call it the Flying Fortress, most awesome plane. Oh, what a feeling of accomplishment, even if he only did a the riveting and on part of it, it was, they couldn't have done it without you. I became an ABS welder, top of the line. I wore a leather suit, I had a helmet with glasses through it, I pulled this down, I could see through the glass in the helmet. I had a suddenly torch to join pieces of steel together. I was determined that I was gonna build ships to show Japan that we would hit back. Thanks in large part to these women workers, American factories turned out 4,000 tanks and 4,500 planes every month. And ships, which used to take one year to assemble, were now being completed in 17 days. Production expectations were not only being met, they were being surpassed. The war years at home, said First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, were no ordinary time and no time for weighing anything except what we can best do for the country. Beyond the sacrifices, large and small, being asked of every American, the social fallout from the war's demand for men and material would change America forever. The American family would be restructured as mothers now left their homes and children to do their part on the nation's assembly lines. There was this thing called the war effort, and it took on a life of its own. You had to be doing something for the war effort. Lights out up there! My father.